Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show a tax attorney with 35 years experience in the field. He works with people all over the world and knows a great deal about cross-border investing, which is a very, very hot topic here on the Goldstein on Geld show. I learned about Rob Wood by reading an article of his in Forbes. Rob, real pleasure to have you. Thanks. Nice to be here, Doug. So I'd like to go over some of the, the very, as we say, tachlis, the nuts and bolts issues that people ask when they are considering giving up their U.S. citizenship because they live outside the United States and they just no longer want to have to deal with it. So let's start with one of, I don't know if it's a myth or a fact, you'll help us. Is it true that once you filed renunci- for renunciation, you're still required to file U.S. tax returns for 10 more years um, it actually isn't true. Uh, I should say it isn't true any longer. Um, unfortunately, and this does give rise to lots of confusion, the U.S. tax law on expatriation has changed multiple times over the last 30 years. And there was a time, not long the rules changed in 2004, they changed again in 2008. Uh, but under current law, if you expatriate now, you do not need to keep filing U.S. tax returns. However, it's important to say that if you still have U.S. source income, even if you are an Israeli living in Israel and, or wherever you are and not having a U.S. Um, US citizenship or a U.S. green card, you still might have to file because if you have U.S. source income, you'd be filing a 1040 NR, the non-resident return. But it isn't a sort of a tail, if you will, that follows you for 10 years the way it used to. So let, let's go over that case, dive in a little bit deeper. Let's say that the U.S. Israel citizen living in Israel 10, 15, 20 years and no longer has any particular ties to the United States. So he gives up his citizenship, but he does like having a brokerage account or a bank account or maybe he has an IRA in the States. Is that going to cause him to have to file the 1040 NR? Um, it, I think it depends. Um, I, I think in most cases the answer is going to be yes. Um, but I think it depends on whether there is whether there's income. Um, but I think it's reasonable to assume that if you have the your um, your Israeli uh, citizen in that example uh, is going to have income generated from those accounts and therefore is going to have U.S. Uh, source income. So I mean, in in some ways, and I'm sure I'm not the only one saying this. Uh, the U.S. may be shooting itself in its uh, foot by many of the rules, including FATCA, that are prompting um, many more people to look at uh, expatriation. But um, that is what's going on, and the numbers are spiking. One of the fears that people have is they, they've heard that if they give up their U.S. citizenship, the IRS is going to take half of their wealth. It's as if they died and they have to pay an estate tax the moment they give up their citizenship. True or false? Um, boy, I, unfortunately, and this I won't be popular for saying it this way, but it, it, it depends, and it's, I guess, a real <laughs> lawyer's answer. Um, it is, they, I mean, many people, including um, dual um, U.S. Israeli citizens and, and many other people around the world uh, with U.S. Uh, citizenship or holding a green card, have been trying to fix their very complex U.S. filings. I'm sure many of your listeners have um, have had uh, FBAR, the Foreign Bank Account Reporting Forms, and and the global uh, tax uh, returns that the IRS expects. A lot of people haven't done a good job in the past about that, and since 2009, when UBS and Credit Suisse and many other banks, including um, uh, Bank Lumi and uh, and other uh, banks in Israel, have had to focus on you know, fixing things in a way that the IRS and the U.S. Justice Department, um, you know, will accept. So, so there's a lot of cleanup in the past. And I'd say if somebody has been scrupulous about their tax returns and other reporting in the past, and 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 sometimes that means having you know really competent uh, tax people helping them, then they probably don't pay much, if anything, to leave. On the other hand, but but I'll, I'll qualify that in a moment. On the other hand, if they have a bunch of cleanup to do, then generally speaking, and this may be counterintuitive, but generally speaking, to do it, quote, right, close quote, the way the IRS wants it, you have to clean up the past and then you exit. You don't just sort of exit and have a an unclean past. So 
I mean, the, 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 I mean there, there are people who, who are doing, um, con- who are sort of off the grid, not, for example, filing U.S. tax returns at all, even though they're U.S. citizens living abroad somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I've seen a, that kind of a person say, you know, some, in some cases, quite understandably, look, I haven't filed U.S. tax returns in 25 years. I live in, you know, X. I'm a citizen there as well as a U.S. citizen. It's sort of an accident that I'm a U.S. citizen. I don't want to file eight years or even even three years or, or five years of U.S. tax returns to fix it all and file all the and, – and risk, uh, Doug, as you just said, losing half my wealth or, or more. So I'm just going to do a consular expatriation, turn in my passport uh, at a U.S. embassy somewhere, and do whatever I have to do, get the certificate of loss of nationality, which is the – people abbreviate and call a CLN – um, and I'm not going to file anything with the IRS. I mean, I've seen a few clients do that, and um, I have not heard of them having problems. However, it's clear that if you do that, you are not cleared by the IRS, and they could come after you. I think most people think in most cases uh, that's probably not likely, but it's possible. So sort of the way to do it properly is to file all the right stuff, and yes, it can mean that you can lose a lot of your assets. We're talking with Rob Wood, who is the author of more than 30 tax books. He's a tax columnist at Forbes, and he's been in the tax business for decades and decades, a great deal of experience he's bringing to the table as he's talking to us about expatriation. Rob, one of the things you said, which actually was interesting to me, is that you pointed out how a lot of the non-U.S. banks were being forced by the United States government to submit information about their clients. They don't want to have U.S. clients. So I've actually found the repercussions of this in my day business have been quite interesting because in real life, I'm a financial advisor. I work with people who live outside the United States who want to have U.S. brokerage accounts. So these people say, Doug, you know, I was at Bank Lumi, but they said, they'll no longer handle my investment portfolio. What can I do? And the answer is, well, you know, obviously we'll take care of it for them because they're also stuck between a rock and a hard place because a lot of the U.S. brokerage firms, except a few special ones that specialize in cross-border, but the big names, they don't want to take clients who live outside the United States. So if you're a U.S. person who's living outside the U.S., it can be very, very complicated to, to manage your money in the way that you may have been doing it for decades. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, Doug, you're absolutely right. I've, uh, you may have seen more of it, but I have seen it too, and I hear many complaints uh, from U.S. persons living outside the U.S. And, and many of these people feel not only entirely disenfranchised, but you know, because they don't have, um, if, they're, if they're not living in a U.S. state, they don't have representatives, they don't have senators, they don't have, a, you know, congressmen that they can call and complain to. And because they're living in in Israel or Paris or wherever they're living, and and you're right, there there's this great deal of discrimination that that it's not merely that they the banks worldwide do not want non-compliant Americans, which one can, given FATCA's uh, sort of a very very huge and scary footprint, one can understand that I think, but I think it's hard to understand how. Um, the, the foreign banks are saying, we don't want any Americans. It's just too much paperwork, too much hassle. And, and as you say, many are doing that. And it, by the way, I mean, there are, there are uh, several lawsuits um, about FATCA. Uh, there's one in Canada, for example, the Canadians are suing the, some Canadians are suing the Canadian government, saying that the agreement that Canada did with the uh, U.S., is unconstitutional under Canadian law. I read recently Rand Paul is uh, the candidate in the U.S. is uh, suing, I believe, to do to undo FATCA. Obviously, the Republican Party has said it wants to undo it, but for now, um, as I'm sure your listeners are finding, it is a royal pain in the neck that worldwide Americans must disclose everything and must hopefully get their banks happy with them. <laughs> it's very tricky. So let me ask you a couple of rapid-fire questions because we're running out of time. Is it true that giving up your U.S. citizenship means you'll never be allowed to visit the U.S. again? Not at all. Um, And I have to put on my uh, careful lawyer hat and say that is not a tax question. It's, of course, an immigration question. So I usually, when I'm dealing with a client who is 
expatriating, I usually ask them to also consult an immigration lawyer because it can vary where they also have a passport. That is, you cannot give up a U.S. passport without having another passport. So you have to be able to be, uh, you, you can't be stateless. So if you had, for example, another passport from some country that was uh, uh, that was not easy to travel on in the U.S., you might be in trouble. But for most people, I think the answer is yes, you can travel. There is no, uh, this is what immigration lawyers tell me, there is no sort of blacklist or something like that that says if you once give up a green card or give up a U.S. passport that they're going to not allow you in. You're just subject to the usual rules for that country's um, citizens. Got it. And the last question will be, if you give up your U.S. citizenship, will you lose your Social Security and Medicare benefits? Boy, that's a great question. Um, and it comes up a lot. And the answer is, predictably, it depends. <laughs> um, the, 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 the tax treaties, and, and obviously, um, since you're speaking from Israel, there, there is a U.S.-Israel tax treaty. Um, I don't think I've actually looked in the case of Israel. I would predict that you don't lose them. I know I've looked for some other countries. I have looked at some countries where you do. For example, my memory is that if you are a Chinese slash U.S. person and you give up your U.S., and um, then you do lose them, as, as I recall. So I think you need to do some homework because obviously – um, it can be leaving money on the on the table. One one thing I I know you're out of time. One thing I do need to correct that I that I glossed over and I should correct, and that is U.S. exit tax. So I think I was focusing on compliance, and you need to look at whether you've complied in the past. But let's just take a person who is a dual citizen and wants to now give up U.S. passport and and just come to the U.S. occasionally as a, as a visitor to visit family, for example. There is, under existing law, an exit tax. And depending on how much money you have and how much money you make, it can result in a capital gain tax as if you sold your assets the day before you left the U.S. Um, listeners might want to get uh, IRS Form 8854. It's an, uh, the instructions in that form. It's basically how you say that you shouldn't pay an exit tax or how you pay it. Um, it's a capital gain tax. There are some exemptions. Generally, if you have less than $2 million of assets, you don't pay it. There are a number of other exemptions. But the bad thing is you could, if you're a person with substantial assets and substantial income, you could get stuck paying tax on, even though you're not selling anything, you could get stuck on the appreciation in assets that you have, um, and, and, and that's a controversial tax, but it is still in the law. So it's certainly something everyone has to look through. Rob, we are now just about out of time, but in the last few seconds, tell us how can people learn more, more about you and the work that you're doing? Well, uh, they can uh, go to my website, which is wood, uh, LLP, that's wood, Larry, Larry Paul .com, wood, LLP com. Uh, they, they, there are a lot of articles there on, and there's, an, I believe, an index and a search window. You can type in exit tax or expatriation or something like that, and you should pull up a bunch of different articles that will have links about different resources you can see. Okay, and we will put a link to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Rob Wood, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. You are listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future. So join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.